Today, I want to review the power of hormones for bone health. We're going to go over the three primary sex hormones in women, estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. I want to show you just how much evidence there is for the use of HRT for bones. I want to walk you through the biggest hitters and talk about, of course, some of the concerns around HRT. So stick around. This is going to be a really fun one. All right, sorry to interrupt this video, but I want to take a moment and talk about this product by 4Well. It's specifically a product utilizing DHEA, saw palmetto, and collagen all together in one. And the reason why I want to talk about this is that you may have heard me discuss DHEA for bone health. In the videos that I did on this topic, DHEA is an interesting pro-hormone that's available over the counter, and it has been studied for bone, but only in what I think are relatively big doses. So 50 milligrams for women and 100 milligrams for men. The challenge here is that if you use these doses of DHEA alone, clinically, what we saw is that women were complaining about oily skin, acne, and potentially even hair loss. So we backed that down and now in our clinical practice use doses between 5 and 20 milligrams. But there are ways to utilize larger doses and potentially even have a positive impact on your hair. And what they did in this product is specifically use things like saw palmetto and collagen to help block the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone and also provide your hair some of the building blocks that it needs through collagen. So let me explain. This product uses 50 milligrams of DHEA, which again is the dose that was studied, but adding in 500 milligrams of saw palmetto and 350 milligrams of collagen. Now the saw palmetto is interesting because this is an herb that uses the same mechanism as finasteride, which is a well-known and well-used hair loss drug. It helps to improve hair loss in both men and women. Now, this enzyme is responsible for the conversion of testosterone to the more active androgenic form dihydrotestosterone, particularly in the periphery, meaning in the skin. So it can actually have an impact on hair. And so we see this both with finasteride, but you also see studies seeing it with saw palmetto too. Now, the collagen is actually here to provide the building blocks, and we know that collagen in different forms and different doses can be good for our skin, hair, and nails. I don't think anybody's disputing that. But when you combine all three, what I think is really compelling is you can take DHEA at higher doses for people who are sensitive like I am, and I've been taking uh, the men's version of this product, which has 50 milligrams of DHEA, which I would not have been able to tolerate alone, and I've not had any androgenic side effects whatsoever. So if you want to check out this product called Advanced Formula Saw Palmetto for Women, this is by the company For Well, and you can take a look at their Amazon store, look at the link in the description here on YouTube, and use the code Dr. Doug For Well. That's D R D O U G the number four in well, W-E-L-L, -L, and you'll get 10% off of anything in their inventory. Let's start with the estrogen controversy. So estrogen is the most controversial of the three hormones, which is actually saying a lot. And there is, of course, fear around estrogen and breast cancer and other estrogen receptor positive cancers. There's fear around estrogen and blood clots and heart disease and stroke and dementia. There's so much controversy around, is it good for heart disease? Is it good for dementia prevention? And can you use it for those things? What about as a tool for actually treating breast cancer? There's so much evidence to review. But here's what I want to talk about, which is that estradiol is actually FDA approved to support osteoporosis to treat a diagnosis of osteoporosis. The other hormones are not, but of course we would use them in tandem. But what I want to talk about is the evidence to support the use of estradiol specifically for bone health because it is abundant. And I think that most doctors who look at hormone literature don't see as much of the bone literature because they're not looking at the osteoporosis literature. If they're looking at osteoporosis and they're looking at bone health literature, you would see this abundance of estrogen information and evidence that estrogen is a profoundly impactful hormone for bones. So recently I was doing some research on a, a talk that I'm doing for an upcoming presentation and I ran across this meta-analysis and I've, I've seen it before, but I've, I haven't looked as deeply at all of the studies in it. So I actually took the time to look at every single study in this meta-analysis and I, I listed them out as their potential outcome on bone mineral density. And I'm just showing this right now, it's not because I want to go into each one of these, but I just want you to see how many studies there are, the potential impact from a bone mineral density perspective and the fact that all of these studies are using HRT in one form or another specifically for bone health. The evidence is out there. Now, I recently recorded an entire video on this. Now, this is a big study from 1998, and it is a, a bone drug study. It's actually on Fosamax or Alendronate. 
And what's compelling about this is that for whatever reason, they chose to compare the drug to HRT and different forms of HRT. So I don't know what they thought they were going to find here, but what they found is that HRT was so much more powerful than were the drugs. And you can see this actually in this chart. So if you look at down here in the middle where it says US cohort and European cohort, that top line is HRT. And in the US and in the European sites, they did it differently. And so the European cohort was much more powerful than both the US cohort and the drugs. So one other thing you can take away from this study, and we'll look at this in other areas as well, is that there are two things here that probably matter. One is the European cohort used as higher doses of estradiol than the US cohort, and they also used a rhythmic style of dosing, meaning that they were actually cycling estrogen and progesterone alternatively, which would result in either breakthrough bleeding or an actual menstrual cycle. But you can see the power of that style of dosing and rhythm versus the static dosing in the US. Now, this third study is a study I've wanted to find for a long time, and I was floored when I actually found it. This is a study looking at a dose response or different doses of estradiol compared to outcomes in bone mineral density. So basically what they did is looked at three different levels and watched this over time. And they also then compared this to estriol, which is really important because so many people are prescribed biased, which is estradiol and estriol. They even state in this paper, they used estriol because they, they quote unquote know that estriol doesn't protect bone. Take that for what it is. I think a lot of doctors don't know that. But they used estriol because they wanted to give them a hormone and essentially make it look like a placebo. And that's what we found because the estriol group lost BMD. When you look at the three different groups of estradiol, the highest dose had the best response. This isn't surprising because remember that different tissues have different levels of saturation of the receptors. We know that there's a threshold around 60 to 80 picogram per ml based off of the literature. A lot of HRT dosing strategies won't get you there. And so this is a great study showing that that 1.25 milligram group was not nearly as powerful as the five milligram group. So there are lots of other studies I could pull up here. There were nine, I think, in this meta-analysis that I went through. But they all show the same thing. It's very consistent. Estradiol will have a positive impact on bone. We're going to talk about the other sex hormones in a second. But estradiol is such an important tool to consider. The risk-benefit analysis is very difficult if your doctor doesn't understand the actual risks and the potential benefits. If they don't understand osteoporosis and the risk, and the risk of fracture, estradiol is such a potent tool when it comes to bone health. And having the risk-benefit conversation with a doctor that understands the actual risks, the updated risks based on recent literature versus the risk that they were taught in medical school or in residency and understands the potential benefits. What is the risk of having a fracture if you have osteoporosis? It's a very challenging conversation. So make sure that you're having that conversation with somebody who understands those current updated risks and benefits for someone in your particular situation. All right, let's talk about progesterone. Progesterone is sort of put in this position of being the assistant to estradiol, which I think is unfortunate because progesterone has benefits for bone, brain, vascular health, nerve health, specifically the myelin sheath, and even cancer prevention, both in the endometrium and the uterus, as well as on the breast. But it's not often studied independently. There's a few studies out there. But it's not often studied independently. It's almost always studied with estradiol or some form of estrogen. And so it's hard to say what the real impact is. Now, we generally are going to deliver it in the uh, bioidentical form in micronized progesterone, either orally as our preference or topically for some women. Please stay away from the progestins. This is my, my plea, which is that these things are devious, they're dangerous, and a lot of the research continues to show this and yet they are just common because they are they have a strong foothold in the pharmaceutical industry micronized progesterone is just as good if not better and less risky and remember that we do need progesterone to balance estrogen there's a reason why it has been paired with estrogen we know that if we give estrogen in an unimposed manner we will see hypertrophy of the lining of the uterus called the endometrium you can also get changes in the breast and this is potentially dangerous so we do need progesterone the underlying questions though are how much what's the timing and so this is, again, where you need to talk with someone who really understands progesterone and how to do it in a, a responsible way, but also in a way that you're going to get the most benefits. One of the things that keeps coming up with progesterone in these bone health studies is that a lot of the original protocols in the 90s and early 2000s used a cyclic form of progesterone. I mentioned that in the European 
arm of the study, the, of the second study we talked about. Rhythmic progesterone will provoke, as I said, either breakthrough bleeding if they're not expecting much bleeding, or they would actually provoke a menstrual cycle depending on how much progesterone and how much estrogen you're using and how you space them apart. This actually used to be pretty common. In fact, even today, if you look at some of the recommendations on how to dose progesterone, you find that the, the baseline recommendation is to do it in a rhythmic manner, even in postmenopausal women. So when I was trained in the hormone world and when most of my colleagues were trained in the hormone world, we didn't really see any of that in training. I think that really went out of vogue about 15 years ago. And now we're seeing kind of a younger population of doctors who are really taking the, uh, the reins on hormone prescribing. And we were never exposed to this. I think what happened is after the Women's Health Initiative, when the idea that we needed to give as little estrogen as possible for the shortest period of time, in this post-WHI era, the idea of having a ramping up and down dose of estrogen went away because nobody wanted to give more estrogen. I shouldn't say that. Less people wanted to give more estrogen, except for those that saw through the, the farce of the WHI data. And so what happened is the, the concept of giving more estradiol went away. It certainly wasn't popular. And then there was a big push to recognize that breakthrough bleeding could potentially be pathologic. And that's a good thing because we do want to catch endometrial cancers, that is important. But not all bleeding is pathologic. But yet there was this mindset that postmenopausal women shouldn't bleed. If they do, it's pathologic. We should give the least amount of estrogen possible so that we don't provoke cancer. So now we have static dosing. But we know that the studies on static dosing are not as impressive as the studies on physiologic dosing. Do women on static dosing improve their bone health? They do. So the challenge is who is going to do fine on static dosing, who is going to need something more aggressive, and we don't know the answer to that. But there is more evidence than I would have ever thought that physiologic or physiologic restoration or rhythmic dosing really was the standard of care that doctors were considering when they were looking at these bone health studies. There are more studies that have rhythmic dosing than static dosing when you go back to the early 2000s in 1990s. All right, so let's talk about androgens. So by androgens, I mean those hormones that are androgenic. They will provoke being anabolic. Androgens include, for women, mostly what we're going to talk about, DHEA and testosterone. Now, testosterone is something that I've started prescribing several years ago, and I do think that lots of women and men do really well on testosterone. However, the Endocrine Society, NAMS, ACOG, they have all come forward with a global position statement that says that testosterone should not be used for anything other than hypoactive sexual desire disorder, and even then should only be used for a short period of time and for nothing else because of the potential risk. And it's not FDA approved for anything. <laughs> so that kind of makes testosterone difficult, especially in the telehealth world, where the DEA is really cracking down in certain states on testosterone availability through telehealth still available locally, brick and mortars. I don't think that's going to go away, but those organizations really don't like testosterone. The government really doesn't like testosterone, or at least it seems that way. So then we should look at some alternatives, but ultimately the decision is who needs testosterone versus who needs the alternatives and how do you decide? And again, this is a case by case basis, but let me walk you through some of the alternatives to testosterone. And then we'll talk about some of the literature in testosterone. Now, I'm not going to go into this in a lot of depth, but I want you to understand that Women have the capacity to produce testosterone in the adrenal glands from precursors for testosterone made in the adrenal glands in the periphery of the body, elsewhere in the body. They produce more testosterone in those locations than they do in their ovaries so that after menopause, they can still produce testosterone, which is pretty smart. Now, if you have adrenal dysfunction as a woman, meaning you have high levels of stress, high cortisol, likely you're not making enough DHEA. If you're not making enough DHEA, you're not going to have enough testosterone. We see it all the time, really common in osteoporosis. Fortunately, DHEA is cheap and easy and over the counter in the US and can be added. There's a bunch of studies that show the benefits of DHEA. In fact, I have like six of them that I just reviewed today. The average increase in testosterone was somewhere around 17 and a half up to 30 and 40 nanogram per deciliter higher than baseline. So DHEA really can increase testosterone and may have a different risk profile or side effect profile than testosterone for a lot of women. Now, DHEA has actually been studied specifically for bone health, and it does turn out that DHEA supplementation can increase bone mineral density and IGF-1, which you'll hear me talk about a lot. So it really can act as an androgen 
it's going to be variable and it's not going to be as powerful as testosterone, but it may be better tolerated, certainly is easier to access. All right. So what about testosterone? Well, when I started learning about testosterone, I learned about it as something that was delivered as a pellet. And I thought that the locations that were doing pellets were delivering way too much testosterone. And my bias is that I see people who are not doing well from other providers, sort of like the go-to guy for my hormones aren't working. And so I saw people coming to me with crazy high levels of testosterone, hair falling out, totally upset. And that's my concern around pellets. So my initial exposure to testosterone, not super positive. But what I've learned is that responsible prescribing of testosterone, usually done through a cream, potentially through an injection, if someone wants to avoid cream, can be done at doses that are physiologic, not super physiologic, and can provide a lot of benefit. So one study that shows this in specifically in women, which is pretty rare, is a study that's looking at estrogen or estrogen plus testosterone. Now, what's interesting, I mentioned earlier that most of the studies on bone health and hormones are using cyclic progesterone, and this one does too. So they're using cyclic progesterone, and then the two groups are estrogen or estrogen and testosterone. Now, ironically, these actually were done with pellets, but take that for what it is. The testosterone group far outperformed the estrogen group. And unfortunately, they didn't actually share the numbers. They have a graph in here and you can see that it's better and it's statistically significant, but you don't actually see the increase in BMD, which is really frustrating that they wouldn't publish that. Um, so we don't know how much it was, but we know that it was statistically significant and that it was better than estrogen alone. So adding androgens helps with bone. And that makes sense. There's another study, this one's in men, but this is a meta-analysis that I pulled for this talk because they looked at over 1,100 men. That was a lot. They looked at testosterone replacement in men and it did increase BMD at six months and in most studies at 12 months. But I said most studies because not all studies. And so some men saw an increase and then they saw a decline. Now, when you look at these studies and you look at all studies on testosterone in men, I have a beef with researchers in testosterone, which is that they don't use enough testosterone. They barely increased levels of testosterone in these men. And so it's not surprising that we don't see much of a change. I see so many studies on testosterone where they say, oh, there was no difference. But they took their levels from like 250 to 300. Well, yeah, they still have low testosterone. They need more testosterone. When we replace testosterone, we are going to replace it to a level at which men looked and felt their best. We're not going super physiologic, but we're not going to stay at 300 or 400 total testosterone. We need to get their free testosterone well into the double digits, and that takes more total testosterone. So a lot of the studies are just underutilizing testosterone, and of course, we're not going to see significant benefits that way. Now, when we talk about any drug, there's always the potential for side effects. And one of the good things about all of the HSDD or hypoactive sexual desire disorder research on testosterone in women is that we do have enough evidence to say what the potential risks could be. These are not huge, but relatively big studies. So what I can say is that there is a risk of quote unquote androgenic side effects, hair growth, hair loss, oily skin, acne, but the big fear that a lot of doctors have is, man, what's testosterone going to do to my risk of breast cancer as a woman? What's it going to do to any other metabolic issues, cholesterol levels, heart disease risk, et cetera? And I think what we can clearly see from evidence in women is that testosterone is protective of breast cancer. So we can cross that one off the list. But more importantly, from a cardiovascular perspective, testosterone does not seem to increase the risk of plaque development and events. And this is really critical because this is more commonly in men, but this is viewed as a risk factor for heart disease, meaning that if someone's on testosterone, they're at higher risk. And that's not true. In fact, having low testosterone is a risk factor for heart disease and heart attack. So we really need to balance these hormones and consider where they could be used for everything, including bone. So in conclusion, I want you to understand that hormone replacement therapy is a really powerful tool. You have to have the conversation with the right person who understands the risk benefit and where you are in your bone health journey. Best guessing what is your fracture risk and does it make sense to challenge some of the traditional dogma around who shouldn't be on hormone replacement therapy because the risk benefit equation for you may make sense even though you may not fit in the little beautiful box that is the perfect person for hormone replacement therapy. So that's it for today. I'll see you in the next video.